Hi, so I'm Austin McCoy, and I'm 15, and my talk is on low-cost, portable, disease detection equipment. So it's mid-October right now, one of my favorite times of the year. However, in tropical nations, mid-October marks the start of many epidemics involving dangerous diseases like dengue fever. So dengue fever is a mosquito-borne illness, and over the past few decades, it's been rapidly increasing in its prevalence, infecting millions of people every year, and killing thousands of people every year. To illustrate this, here's a map showing the spread of dengue fever from the World War II era to up until now. As you can see, dengue fever is rapidly becoming a worldwide issue that is affecting nearly every region of the world. So why are we worried about dengue fever? Well, as Dr. Eva Harris, one of the world's leading researchers in dengue fever put it, we're worried because it's spreading out of control like a bat out of hell. So I first took an interest in dengue fever in seventh grade when I researched it as a science fair project. However, dengue fever became truly impactful to me when my mentor, Dr. Chris Perrette, returned from India and told me a story about a young boy who perished of dengue fever simply because they couldn't diagnose his disease. Those words had such an impact on me that I'm now here today telling you a story about this new emerging technology that'll stop these needless deaths. So how do we diagnose dengue fever? and other similar diseases. Well, we diagnose it through a process called PCR. PCR revolutionized the medical industry when it arrived. It provides a fast, accurate diagnosis for patients to determine what disease they have. However, PCR, unfortunately, is not as ideal as it sounds. First of all, it's not affordable. It can cost between $10,000 and $25,000, greatly limiting its access to only first world nations of ample funding. Second of all, it consumes lots of electricity, between 500 and 800 watts, which prohibits it from being implemented in developing nations that often experience power outages or don't have stable amounts of large electricity. And lastly, it's not portable, preventing the implementation of the machine in rural regions of the world. So after learning that PCR is the gold standard for disease detection, I researched a little bit more about what PCR is. Well, first of all, PCR involves a tissue sample or a blood sample or a saliva sample collected from the patient. Then it heats the sample and cools it for one sole purpose. Duplicate the amount of DNA in the sample. In a matter of minutes, it can produce billions of copies of DNA that can then be used to analyze the sample to determine what disease a patient has. Another huge inspiration to me in this project was Dr. Eva Harris, who I mentioned earlier. She's a pioneer in this field of implementing low-cost technologies across the world. So Dr. Eva Harris even outlined the characteristics necessary for a machine to be accessible to developing nations in a book entitled, A Low-Cost Approach to PCR. Not only did she write a book like this, she even pioneered her own technique in performing PCR. So what is needed? What did she write about? What's needed to make a machine accessible to developing nations? Well, first of all, it needs to have a lab grade accuracy. You cannot sacrifice the accuracy of the machine, otherwise PCR will not be effective or even worthwhile. Second of all, it must be, in, or it must be affordable and inexpensive so that it can be accessible by developing nations that don't have large amounts of funding. Next of all, it needs to be easy to maintain and repair locally because it can cost exorbitant amounts of money to constantly import and export the machine for repair or maintenance. It also needs to be portable, non-fragile, and rugged so it can survive any terrain and can be transported easily. It must be battery-powered or AC-powered so it can work in on-site implementations and so it can integrate with first-world labs or even third-world labs that do have access to good electricity. And lastly, it must be intuitive and user-friendly because many free, current, donated thermocyclers go to waste simply because they're not intuitive and the users don't know how to perform PCR. So after learning about these characteristics, I began my venture at the age of 12 to help combat this problem and design a low-cost, portable disease detection system. So this led me to my first design, which was a complex design that simply pumped ratios of hot and cold water into a central mixing tank to perform PCR. Unfortunately, there was too much heat loss, so this design was not successful. But it did turn into my second design that was a more compact version of the first design, and this machine did it successfully perform the temperatures required for PCR. Unfortunately, it wasn't necessarily the most safest design possible. <laughs> 
It was connected to boiling vats of water that could easily fall over and injure the user. But I did learn, though, that simplicity is better than complexity, because often complexity results in situations like this. <laughs> so this lesson manifested itself in my third design, which utilized a robotic arm to transfer test tubes between different baths of oil, which simply were the stages of PCR. This thermocycler could efficiently perform PCR, and because of that, I entered it into the National Science Fair and won the first place award in technology. This award afforded me a scholarship to attend an internship in India or any summer camp of my choice. However, several weeks after my return, my mentor informed me of an opportunity to take place in an internship in India where I could learn about the first, world or the first applications for this machine and the implications that this machine could have. So this took me to New Delhi, India. However, being 13 at the time and without parents, they wanted some reassurance that I was okay. So I sent them an image of me in a parking lot with a cobra charmer. <laughs> Aside from cobra charmers, I did do some efficient stuff, so I met with many wonderful groups of people in India, including lab researchers, I met with universities and spoke to them. I met with local teachers and just other lab technicians. And all these groups provided wonderful perspectives on how to improve my machine. I combined these perspectives into my fourth design, which is a more compact version of my original design. However, they also pointed out that my machine wasn't accurate, as accurate as they wanted it to be. So to improve the accuracy, I learned calculus and used that knowledge to design a lab grade system. After learning that, I was now able to successfully diagnose every disease with this machine. So after designing the successful machine, I pitted it head-to-head -head against conventional thermocyclers. With the assistance of my mentor, Stephanie Westcott, I showed that my machine can effectively produce comparable results to those of a conventional laboratory thermocycler. However, I was not done yet. I still had to produce, I still had to produce a final manufacturable prototype. To do so, I had to raise money, so one source was to combine my knowledge of programming with my passion for games, math, and science to produce apps that I sold for money. I also took that revenue source in combination with a donation from a small church group in Iowa to fund my fifth prototype. This fifth prototype utilized my knowledge of 3D modeling skills to create a 3D model of the design. First of all, it could now be manufactured since it was all modeled and diagrammed. But more importantly, it could utilize a new emerging technology, 3D printing, to allow the parts to literally be 3D printed. One good aspect to this is that I can drastically reduce the cost. For example, this aluminum gear previously cost between $13 to $17, but now because of this 3D printing technology, it can cost around $1. Not only that, I can produce customizable designs that were previously impossible with the technologies that I had access to. Another important part in developing my final manufacturable prototype was the circuit board. So the previous circuit board was disjointed and was a jumbled mess and difficult to produce and install into my machine. So I spent the summer with my dad who taught me how to do this and we produced a printed circuit board that could be easily manufactured and installed into my machine. It was more clean and sleek. However, it was not done yet. I still had to produce the final part to use this duplicated DNA, which involved the optical detection system. As complex as it sounds, it's as simple as shining a light into the test tube through a filter and it glows if the disease is there. However, as simple as it may be, it's still important as it completes the final step required to diagnose diseases successfully. So after finalizing this machine, I'm now at the process of trying to implement this machine. So I'm going to approach this in a phased approach involving first high schools, then universities, and finally, hopefully, mobile labs to fully utilize its portability, low power, and low cost features. So a good way to describe this entire process was a quote by Thomas Edison, I failed my way to success. No first design always worked and was completely successful. It required persistent hard work to produce a final prototype. And I also learned that teamwork and collaboration is essential in solving solutions like these. And I also learned that in life, and in technology especially, simplicity often prevails over complexity. In 2015, Nature published an article on these new emerging technologies that may transform the way we track and diagnose diseases. Now, these technologies may never be as heard of as technologies like video games or smartphones because suffering is silent. 
The world doesn't take notice when its people are healthy. We don't count epidemics that don't happen. But remember, when the world's becoming a healthier place, and when epidemics are scarce, it's not by accident. And these are the children whose faces continue to inspire me to push onward. Thank you.